evening. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. Go ahead and stand. Find a hymnal close by. We're going to start with page number seven. Blessed be the name, page number seven. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the last verse of this song. This evening, thank you for coming. Good to have Brother Tomlinson and his wife here with us tonight. They're back up in this area for a bit, and so good to have them here, and as well as others. And Caleb is his first time uh, leading the singing here tonight. Did a good job. Did better than I could do. I was, I'm always nervous whenever I do it. I can do it, but I'm, I'm just like a fish out of water. And so, but uh, it looked like he did a, a good job. Good to have Brother Pitcher's dad here tonight. Now he's a he's a nice man, unlike his son. So. Uh, <laughs> Brother Pitcher's back there listening, but uh, it's good to have him here from Louisiana? Originally from Louisiana, now from Omaha. Omaha, okay. All right, well, nice to have you here. Let's go ahead and bow our heads together. Oh, before we do so, Mrs. White is in the hospital, and uh, she, they, they took her uh, water pills away, and she started having some problems like Mrs. Uh, Chancellor did, and so she decided to go down to the hospital, and they brought her in to do some kind of tests or whatever but anyway she's in the hospital so pray for her if you will <clears throat> all right let's pray now father we do come we ask your blessings on mrs chancellor I i'm sorry well her too but uh, mrs white now i pray you'll be with her as she's in the hospital and help her to recover so that she can go home and lord they were looking so uh, forward to being back with us in church and they wanted to be here so badly and uh, so i pray that you'll bless them and help them to get back on their feet so they can keep coming and then, Lord, would you meet with us tonight as we, uh, as we open the Word of God and study from it, be with the little boys and girls across the way there in the educational building as they, they're taught as well. But would you do something in this service tonight for all of us? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Turn in your songbooks to page number 94, Little is Much When God is in It, page 94.
that on the second verse. Let's lift it up all together on the third verse. Ready? Are you laid aside from service? Body worn from toil and care. You can still be in the battle in this sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in. guest here tonight please remain seated for a moment and let me have our members stand together at this time and uh, we got brother pitcher's dad here tonight with us so that's good and uh, I don't see any other first-time guests here tonight so let's all stand together and shake hands with each other If you'll find your places and uh, let's hear quickly here. Don't forget the uh, all, there's a bowling activity for the junior age kids, first three, first through sixth grade, and it's going to be on Tuesday, June 22nd. The bus is going to leave the church at 10:30, and the cost for the activity is $12, which includes uh, bowling, shoe rental, uh, and pizza. They're going to have some pizza afterwards. Please sign up in the back, back there, or across the way when you pick up your children, if you'd like to. And uh, if there's any questions for the activity, you can see Mrs. Jessica Tuiola-Sega. And so she's the one that's in charge of that. Also, if you've signed up for the uh, prayer time during the preaching, there's a list on the back of the, uh, in the back back there where you can pick up, take one home so you can see when you have that scheduled for yourself. There's also one in the information, a uh, little, what do you call those things? Curio, it's not a curio cabinet, it's a, some kind of cabinet. Information cabinet? Bulletin, okay. Bulletin board, it's up there. All right, all right. Pray for Scott Chambers. This is the Sweets, uh, Mrs. Sweets' uh, nephew, and he has cancer. He's been dealing with it for some time, and it's not been doing, uh, having any success so far. So if you will, pray for him. Also, baby parade coming up on Sunday morning. This Sunday morning, we're going to have a good time in here with them. You'll get to hear what it's like if we don't have uh, a nursery. And I hope you'll gain an appreciation for all those that work in the nursery because of that. But invite your uh, grandparents, if they live in the area, so they can come take your pictures and invite friends to come and be on that day with us as well. Also, Brother Randolph's meeting is tomorrow and Friday. If you can go out there, please do so. And the address is, I'm going to write it, I'm going to give it to you here, so write it down if you've got a pen ready. It's uh, Lighthouse Baptist Church. That's where he's using it. It's Brother uh, Morris's uh, church, or it used to be. And Brother um, Pearlstein's pastoring there now. But it's 1222 uh, Bronson Way North. 1222 Bronson Way North. And that's in Renton, Washington. It's Unit 50. That's, that's uh, I guess, they, it's in a strip mall. So they got, uh, um, uh, it's called Units, but it's Unit 50. Uh, but you don't have to type that in on the address, I don't think, on your GPS. Uh, but as you walk up, uh, there's, a, there's a strip mall here. It's on the right, and it goes like this, and it's the last one on your right there, so you'll be able to uh, find it because of that. Also, uh, let's see here. This Sunday night, June 13th, we're going to have 
uh, an acknowledgement of all of our graduates for the high school and the college. And so we're going to have a number of them up here. We're going to ask them what they're doing. And, and uh, we've got something for them as well. We've got six high school graduates, two college graduates, and uh, we're going to celebrate their accomplishments. We're going to have a fellowship after the service out in the educational building, and we're just having hot dogs. So if you want more than that, better eat before you come to church. Uh, but we're going to have some hot dogs and chips and drink, and uh, we're going uh, to recognize them uh, on Sunday night. And so looking forward to that. I know they're looking forward to that, graduating. They get out into the real world now, and they get to pay their own bills, we hope. We hope. And uh, life's good once you get out in the real world. Caleb, you ready? Okay, let's open up our hymnals again. Turn to page 168. We're going to sing the first and the third of Mansion Over the Hilltop, page 168. I'm satisfied with just a cottage bee. Time to take our offering. Brother Chancellor, would you lead us in prayer, please?
to take your Bibles open to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. If you're able to stand, go ahead and stand. And uh, it, Brother uh, Caleb here that led the singing, he's interning here this summer, and, and uh, we're going to have him. We've had him for two weeks now, putting him with different uh, staff members and different things. We're trying to get him uh, a taste of everything that he might face out in the ministry and been doing a good job here. And and I just want to keep him before you because come the end of the year or summer when he heads off to college, we need to take a good offering for him. And so if you will be planning for that now, do that. And so we can send him off with a good offering. All right. Mark chapter 6 is where we're going. And we're going to read, uh, let's see here, verses 14. Uh, let's see here, through 18. We'll read 14 through 18 tonight. We're going to be looking at some others here, but uh, 14 through 18 will get us started. So join me on the odd verses. The Bible says, and, the king, and king Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. And therefore mighty work do show, works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias. And others said that it is a prophet or one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded, for he is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Notice it says brother Philip's wife, but he had married her, so it's, that's kind of uh, odd. But anyway, it says, uh, verse 18, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And uh, I want to speak to you tonight on the, on the subject, it, is anything worth dying for? Is anything worth dying for? Our Father, tonight as we look at this uh, uh, portion of Scripture in this chapter, I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see some truths that we can apply to our lives and in the uh, characters that's mentioned in the story here and what was going on and what, what, what took place in their lives and what they did and how we can learn some lessons for our lives so that we won't make some mistakes or we can do some things that John did that's, that's good and commendable. But Lord, tonight, would you speak to us, please? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Some place to trust in the wisdom of another. Some search for light in the dark. But like a child, I have come with simple faith in the only one who can change my heart. I believe God. I believe His word is true. For I've seen what He can do. When I call upon his name, I believe God. So let the world say what they will. I will choose to serve him still, knowing he will never change. I believe God. Some say this life is the only thing that matters. Some say we live, then we die. But I'm convinced that eternity awaits. So with every breath I will testify. I believe God. I believe His word is true. For I've seen what He can do. When I call upon His name, I believe God. Let the world say what they will. I will choose to serve him still, knowing he will never change. I believe God. I believe his word is true. I've seen what he can do when I call upon his name. I believe God. Let the world say what they will. I choose to serve him still, knowing he will never change. I believe God. I 
that. Uh, when the United States went to uh, invaded uh, Iraq, they was uh, to depose Saddam Hussein, there was uh, not all Americans were in favor of the war. Some were protesting it and they did not want us to go into Iraq. And they interviewed one young man on the news and uh, they asked him why he opposed the war. And his answer was, nothing is worth dying for. Nothing is worth dying for. Uh, I disagree with that man. I think some things are worth dying for. And um, Americans were, were shocked by the brutality of, of the uh, Arabs over there in the Middle East and whatnot. But we've got to remember that that's the way they, they've always been that way. The Romans, when they were in power, they would crucify people. And that was considered the most severe form of uh, execution and for their own citizens they would not even even do that and so the the uh, the uh, Roman Empire did that and the Middle Eastern countries as well they're known for that kind of uh, barbaric brutality and we're not used to it as Americans they actually feel like that beheading someone is actually more humane than crucifying someone and so that's, uh, you know, if, if that can kind of make a little sense, I don't know. But the Romans executed their criminals and slaves by crucifixion, uh, but they would not execute their own citizens that way. And uh, in Acts chapter 12, when Herod Agrippa, the Bible says that he, he killed James with a sword. It's referring to the beheading there that, that he uh, chopped his head off. And so that's... that's uh, uh, that's part of the nature over there, even though it's barbaric, and we don't we think that is that is brutal, and we shouldn't be doing that. But there's an interesting story I read about this, and uh, you have to hang on to that till we get there. About this uh, uh, this daughter in the story here, where she danced before Herod, and how she died. And I don't know if it's true because it's not in the Bible, but uh, it's an interesting story. I think you'll understand it. But I want to give you the four characters that are in in this story here, and and look at a few things, give you a few details about each individual one, and then we'll get into the, uh, the uh, lessons we can learn, a lesson from each of their lives. First of all, the, the characters. The, the story has been the subject of many art displays. There's been, uh, I've seen pictures, not the actual paintings, but I've seen pictures of the paintings where uh, they're painting depicting John the Baptist uh, pointing his bony finger at, at, at Herod and uh, while he's sitting on the throne there and that's that's been uh, there's been numerous ones from what I understand numerous paintings like that different ones and it's been a, a bit of a hot topic and, and of doing artwork and things like that but the name Herod it was a common family name it was a number of people was named Herod there's actually what that's what makes it confusing a little bit in the Bible because there were eight people named Herod and so when you're reading about them you know you're trying to keep them all separated in your mind and some of them's called Herod Antipas some of, one's called Herod Tetrarch I don't know if I'm saying that right or not and I did not know that until studying this but the word Tetrarch is the name that is given to the Herod if he's not a king but he controls four townships or four cities and so if you control four cities even though you might be called a king you're not the main king okay like Caesar yeah, but you might be called a king the Bible does mention King Herod here but it, he's not the main king he's just over four cities he's uh, he, he's the uh, uh, the, the one over that. But uh, he's the son or one of the sons of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was the Herod in charge, I guess, when Jesus was born. And remember the wise men came and they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And, and uh, you know, they wouldn't tell him where he was at. And so he said, okay, we're, gonna, we're just going to kill all the boys uh, uh, two years old and under. That was Herod the Great. That was this Herod's father that did that and so all of those those guys were were, were brutal and and whatnot but Herod the Great was a paranoid and jealous guy he killed some of his wives we can almost understand that one you know sometimes you know but he killed his sons some of his sons if he felt like they were trying to take the throne he would have them killed 
And uh, so uh, uh, there was a joke that I, I read, and I don't know if it was, they say the joke of the rabbis, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they said that the inside joke was it's, it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be one of Herod's sons because uh, the pig will live longer than the sons will because he's going to fear you're taking over the kingdom. I don't know if that uh, uh, was the joke back then or if just somebody said it today. But he's a ruler over small four, er four small areas. That's why he's called a, and I don't know if I'm saying that word right or not, tetrarch or what have you. But uh, he always wanted to be called the king. He always wanted to be the, the main king over everyone. And so that was his grand desire like politicians go into politics and their, their grand desire might be to be the president one day. I, I don't know, but, but uh, that was his, his main desire. So that's Herod that we're talking about here. I think he's called Herod Antipas, uh, if, if I got that one right. But anyway, the second character is Herodias. Herodias was a, was a younger lady, a younger, a real younger lady. And uh, she's what we would call the Jezebel of the New Testament. And uh, she was not a very nice lady at all. She had an intense hatred for John the Baptist. And uh, he wanted, uh, she wanted him put to death. And she wanted him put to death because he publicly preached against their relationship. Can you imagine? It's not like today. I can preach against the president here. You know, who cares? You know, and it doesn't get out there. But in this day, when you stood up and you preached against the, uh, the king, I mean, word spread. And, of course, she hears about this, and she does not like what's going on. She's the granddaughter of Herod the Great. So you, you see what's going on here. we got Herod the Great. One of his sons is this Herod here, Herod Antipas. And then over here was another son, and he had a daughter, and, and that's Herodias right here. This is who he went, and, uh, and they got together here is what we were saying. But she's the granddaughter of, King, of Herod the Great. And uh, one time when her uncle went to visit the home, uh, she, uh, she was already married by that time and she grew tired of her husband. This is what history goes and what, what we've read from commentaries and whatnot, how they learn. She got tired of her husband and so she, it says she seduced this Herod here to, uh, and, and she said, I'll, I'll marry you if you'll, or he said, I'll marry you if you get rid of your husband, if you divorce your husband. I don't know if she divorced him or not. Because the history also goes to says that his wife heard about this and she was a, a queen of, uh, of uh, oh man, I can't think of the word now of what I was uh, trying to think. But anyway, uh, um, she, grew, she grew tired of her husband anyway she, and she, she ran back home to dad is what she did. She was from another country or whatnot and her father was a king and I can't think of the country all of a sudden right now. But that's this, this woman here, the Jezebel of the Old Testament or the New Testament and this is Herodias and she had an intense hatred for Herod. I mean, I'm sorry for uh, John the Baptist because he got up and publicly, I mean publicly just raked her over the coals and he even said to, uh, said to Herod himself that the relationship ship you got is not right, it's not legal, it's not right, you should, and, and it's sin, and so she wanted to have him killed because of that, because he publicly embarrassed her. Now her daughter here, the Bible doesn't say her name, but uh, Josephus, who was a uh, history writer back in that day and time, says that he, he, the daughter's name was Salome. And uh, I don't know if that's true or not. It's not in the Bible, but that's what, uh, what they say. So I'm going to call her that tonight. But she was the victimized daughter because she was the one that uh, her mother was the one that got her to dance. Uh, when she knew what was going to happen and, and she knew what, when, they, when this all started up that the wine was going to be flowing and uh, she knew that her husband had a weakness for dancing women and they had a lot of that going on at that time so she trained her daughter and taught her daughter when this happens here uh, he's going to call you and I want you to dance for him she had a plan that she put into play and so uh, but the word that's used for her here is a young teenager now, it was not uncommon for teenagers to get married at 16 years old in this day and time. My grandmother that married my grandfather got married at age 16. She was 16 and he was already in his 40s. There was like 18 years difference there. And I just remember grandma saying all the time, she said, I wouldn't advise that for anybody because she ended up being the babysitter at one time. But in any case, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter, you know. But anyway, the, the word used for this lady here, though, is younger than 16. And the word that's used for her is the word that's used to describe Jairus' daughter, which was 12 years old. 
So here we have Herodias, who has a 12-year-old daughter, and she's teaching her daughter now that, that, that she knows the wine's going to start flowing and, and that her husband has a weakness for the dancing women, you know. And, and so uh, she says, she tell, tells her daughter, so this is going to happen. I want you to uh, learn this dance, and, and she's going to go in and dance before her, uh, her husband there. So she's using her daughter as a pawn to uh, get at John the Baptist. She wants John the Baptist dead, and uh, she can't do that because Herod feared the people because he was considered to be a prophet. <laughs> so that's uh, Salome, if that's her name there. And then the fourth character, of course, is God's faithful prophet, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a faithful preacher. He was like Samson. He took a Nazarite vow, and uh, that means he didn't cut his hair or his beard. He let his beard grow out, and, and that, that was part of the Nazarite vow. He was a man of the wilderness. He ate locusts and wild honey, and uh, he, he wore garments made of camel's hair. And his favorite clothing label was Camel Klein. I was just seeing if you got it, you know. Okay. Seeing if he's listening there, you know, he's making just got to wake some people up. But in uh, any case, uh, and uh, he baptized Jesus even though he felt unworthy to do so. And Jesus uh, said it, it must needs be done. And so he felt unworthy. And uh, some people a even asked him, are you the Messiah that should come? And he said, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm the, I'm the forerunner. I'm the introduce the Messiah. And uh, that's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. God's plan for him was to introduce the Messiah or point him out to everybody and then pass off the scene. That's why he said, He must increase and I must decrease. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And so... Uh, we see here that uh, the Baptist preacher John was publicly, he publicly preached against, uh, against their relationship. And by the way, uh, his last name wasn't Baptist. It's John the Baptist. See, he's a Baptist preacher, okay? And uh, so if Jesus was baptized in a Baptist church, anyway, that's where you go then. And uh, try to, I use that with Catholics, you know, sometimes they say, well, you get baptized in a Methodist church, what are you? Well, you're Methodist. Get baptized in a, a Catholic church, what are you? You're Catholic. Well, if you get baptized in a Baptist church, what are you? And you're Baptist. Well, who baptized Jesus? He's John the Baptist. And so that helps them to get this. But in any case, the Baptist preacher, John, he, uh, he publicly preached against their relationship he said it was both illegal and immoral for him to have his, uh, both his niece and his sister-in-law here. And uh, it was a public disgrace that he did that, that John preached that, that infuriated Herodias and she wanted John the Baptist dead, but yet she couldn't because, because uh, Herod w feared the people. But to appease his wife, he had him arrested. So he had him arrested and thrown in, into prison. And uh, they say that the prison that he was in was a desert fortress called Marcarius. It was near Jericho. And uh, so, but that, anyway, he's in prison and uh, he's trying to appease his wife, you know, because if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know, understand that? And so that's what's going on there. That's the four characters in our story here. Now let's look at the actions that they took. That part of the world is known for its brutality. It's known for its violence of the rulers. I mean, in reading the Bible, you know what? They, they, they all were killing people. And you know how brutal it was? Even Christians, they'd throw them in the Colosseums. If you've ever been to Rome and, and you see the Colosseums over there, I mean, they, they just, it was a brutal thing here. But anyway, we're having a birthday party. Look at verse 21. The Bible says, And when a convenient day was come, Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. So it's his birthday. I don't know how old he was, but it's his birthday here. And he invited many special guests to come and uh, enjoy this birthday party here. And Herodias saw her opportunity here because she knew that the wine would be flowing. She knew that her husband had a weakness for the dancing women. And so she hatched this wicked plan that she was going to try to get to uh, John the Baptist. She knew the wine was going to be flowing. And so she coached her young daughter to dance this sensual dance. And, uh, you, and, and, and everybody loved it. It. Everybody loved it because even Herod said, tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. I'll give you even up to half the kingdom. And the funny thing about that is he didn't have a kingdom to give her because he was only the ruler over four small towns. And so he didn't have the kingdom. It's not like Caesar where he can give half the kingdom. And so he didn't have... So what he was doing there, he was basically bragging in front of all his guests because he, he made that statement there, give me anything you want. 
and uh, I, 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 he said, I'll give you anything you want. And so that's, that's what they did. And verse, verse 22 is where it's at. It says, And when the daughter of uh, the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me, of me what, whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swore unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. But he didn't have a kingdom to give. He's probably thinking... She'll want, she's 12 years old, I want a new pony, uh, maybe a, a new dress, maybe a doll, maybe go on a, a Disneyland or something like that. You know, he's probably thinking something like that, not that she's going to come in, but she didn't really know what she wanted. She ran into the, where her mother was and told her mother that, and it says in verse 24, And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? Or what shall, yeah, what shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Now, I don't know about you. But it just seems like to me the daughter would have been very disappointed there. I wonder what Herodias offered her if she would say the head of John the Baptist. Because if I was a young lady and I had an opportunity to get a pony or a head of someone, I think I'd choose the pony. Uh, I don't think I'd choose the head. So she must have had a, a, an enormous influence over her. But in any case, she said, what shall I ask? And, and she said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And it says, at verse 25, And she came in straightway with haste unto the king. So when her mother said that, she ran right out there. She didn't wait. She didn't take her time. It says she ran straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in the charger the head of John the Baptist. Now, he didn't want to have him killed because he feared the people because of, uh, he thought, they thought he was a prophet. And it says, Then the king was exceeding sorry, yet for the oath's sake, and for the sakes which sat with him, their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. So in other words, he made this bragging statement here. He said, I, I love that. That was great. You did a great job. I'll tell you what, ask me anything you want. I'll give it to you. Even up to half the kingdom. Probably bragging in front of his friends. And they all heard him. She, she runs away, and he's probably thinking, well, I got rid of her. And a few minutes later, here she comes back. She says, I know what I want. He says, what? I want the head of John the Baptist. Can you imagine? And she said, I want you to put it in a charger and bring it to me. And it says he was sorry for this. He didn't really want to do that, but he said he, he would not reject her. So in other words, he was having to save face. And I guess it was better for John the Baptist to lose his head for him to lose his face, so to speak, and saving face here. So we see the story here. It says, straightway and with haste she ran and she went and told him what she wanted. The second scene here that's taking place a few minutes later, a little while later, I don't know how far away this was from the kingdom, is the dungeon where John the Baptist is being held. He's sitting there in his cell and all of a sudden he hears some doors clanging and he hears some soldiers marching down the aisleway and they're getting closer to his cell and we see here and, and they're approaching and he's probably wondering what, what's, what's happening here. Am I, am I getting out? And then when he sees the swords, he probably thinks, no, I'm about to die. And um, he's, he's, um, he's thinking that. And you know, remember when John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease? I wonder if that was going through his mind when he saw the soldiers coming. And when he saw them grab him and take him out and bend him over a chopping block and take the swords out, I wonder if he was wondering, he must increase and I must decrease at the same time. Notice verse 27. The Bible says, and immediately, notice now, after, after she said, I want the head of John the Baptist, he sa it says he would not reject her. And it says, and immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. So he did that right away. And it says, And they brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. As I said earlier, there's been a lot of famous paintings about this story here, about John the Baptist pointing his fingers, one of them, and Herod. There's another one that goes along about where uh, this story here, this second part of it, where the damsel is dancing there, and you got Herod sitting on the throne, and, and you got the uh, damsel there, and you got Herodias there, and, and uh, that one was by a, 
um, uh, an artist named Marani in 1680, and it says you can see uh, Herod as he stares at the daughter when she's asking for the head of John the Baptist. I guess you get online and see a lot of these things online or whatnot. But anyway, Herodias had an intense hatred for, for John the Baptist because he publicly preached against uh, their, their sin. And you know, sometimes people have always gotten mad at preachers because they publicly preach against their sin, you know, and, and uh, so that's why we need to keep our, li our lives straight. But now let's get into the lessons we can learn from each one of them. I got one lesson from each one. Don't worry, it's not going to be long, and so uh, we're still got a lot of time anyway. First of all, Herod. Herod. The lesson we can learn is a guilty conscience is a cruel companion. A guilty conscience is a cruel companion. If you look at verse number 16, they're talking about, it's almost like it's jumping ahead, but it says, And when Herod heard thereof, he's ta talking about the miracles that's taking place and whatnot. He's, he's, Jesus sent his disciples to go out, and they're going out and doing miracles and whatnot. And he hears about Jesus, of course. And it says in verse 16, When Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. So it's almost like this portion should be later on in the story about what's happening. But, but it, it, that portion is told at the very beginning. Then it goes into what happened. And so he's hearing about the, the uh, miracles that are taking place. He hears about Jesus and, and he automatically says, it's John. He's come back to haunt me from the dead. And so it just shows us here that a guilty conscience is a cruel companion. I could imagine he probably had some uh, bad dreams in his life about John the Baptist. Uh, he probably woke up in the middle of the night, his pajamas were all sweaty and, and his heart was racing and whatnot because he's having some bad dreams about uh, John the Baptist and having him executed because he knew what he'd done was wrong. But you know, God has given every one of us a conscience. And that conscience is, is designed to act that way, to show us when we've done wrong, to help us to not do those things. It, it, it's there to teach us or to show us what's right and wrong. And we have a conscience. Now, of course, the Bible says we can sear our conscience like with a hot iron. When I was in grade school, there was a young girl that had, uh, she crawled under the, uh, the ironing board when her mother was ironing. And I guess she bumped the ironing board and it fell off and, and she was on her hands and knees and, it, and, it, and she had a big scar on her calf, the side of her calf that was about that long, about the length of an iron. And uh, she had that big scar there and she had no feeling in it. And if you've got a scar of some sorts that you've maybe had from surgery or whatnot, you can touch the scar and there's not much feeling in it. But uh, that's the way our conscience can be if we don't listen to it. If we, if we ignore it and ignore it and ignore it, we can, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, sear our conscience. You know? But you know, we don't have to live with a guilty conscience. But uh, it's given to us to know right from wrong. And the reason we often feel guilty about sin is because we are guilty about our sin. And that's the reason why. And you ought, to, you ought to thank God if your conscience hasn't been seared because that's what God has used and is using to help keep us on the straight and narrow, if I could put it that way. But you don't have to live with a guilty conscience. First John 1 John 1.9, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, that's what God wants to do for us. You can live free of guilt if you'll just confess your sin. Now, the word confess is the word homo legeo, meaning uh, to say the same thing that God says about it. And so we can't say it's a mistake. I grew up in a... Uh, Church of Christ Church, and, and uh, they believe you can lose your salvation, so, and they also believe you've got to be baptized to be saved. So, you know, if we sin every week, everybody in the church would have to get baptized every week, you know, because that's essential for salvation, according to their doctrine. So, so to, in order to keep people from having to get baptized every week, they call some things mistakes and not sins. And uh, so the Bible says we've got to say the same thing about it that God says. It's not a mistake, it's sin. So we see here that a guilty conscience is a cruel companion. The lesson we can learn from Herodias, the Jezebel of the New Testament, is hateful anger spills out and hurts those that are close to you. It spills out and hurts those that are close to you. The sad story here about Herodias is her, ra her rage at John the Baptist was like a deadly infectious disease that not only affected her, but it affected her husband and her young daughter of 12 years old. And so that destroyed her daughter and, and her husband. And the principle, the sad principle here is, is that sin not only affects the individual, but it affects those around us as well. 
It's like if a woman that's expecting a baby, if, they, if she goes and injects crack cocaine into her body, she's going to not only sinning herself, but she's also affecting the baby that's inside her body. A man that smokes like a chimney is also affecting those with secondhand smoke. And, and you know, I, I, I'm sure there's some secondhand smoke, but I grew up around secondhand smoke. You know, I mean, my mom and stepdad smoked all the time. And, and, uh, but you know, still, though, you know, it, it, it's not good and we shouldn't be doing it. It's sin, so still the case. But like, sin is like a pebble thrown in a pond. You know, it gives that ripple effect as it goes out and it affects everything around it. And that's the way sin does in our lives. But Herod here had a jealous nephew uh, called Herod Agrippa. This is another one of the Herods. There's eight of them, so it's hard to keep them straight. And this is the brother of Herodias. Okay, so try to keep that in your mind. So you got the Herod that she married and then she's got her brother. Now he's Herod Antipas and uh, when, uh, when he got older, he wanted to become the king, so he had to get rid of Herodias' husband so that uh, uh, you know, he could be in the line to become the king, and he wanted to have that. And so he went to the main king, and he told the king that he was guilty of treason, and the story goes that their titles and their property were stripped from them, and they lived in obscurity the rest of their lives. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. The Bible doesn't say. That's just what commentaries and other things say. The story about Salome... Uh, the, the, the lesson we learn from her is be sure your sin will find you out. Uh, that's what Numbers 32, 23 says. But history records Salome that she was uh, somewhere and vacationing in the northern Alps. This is what I read. It's not in the Bible. Vacationing in the northern Alps. They was crossing a, a frozen lake. And I guess it was been around the time where it could break or not break or whatnot. And anyway, the, the ice cracked. She fell through the ice. And in the process of retrieving her from the ice, I don't know how they did it, but it just says here, uh, crossing the frozen river when the ice cracked in efforts to extract her from the frozen river, a jagged piece of ice severed her head from her body. I don't know if that's true or not. But if, if be sure your sin finds you out, it certainly fits. But uh, whether or not that story is actually true, I don't know. But it goes well with the sermon, so please just forgive me if it's not true. The lesson we learned from John the Baptist is where I really wanted to get to tonight, is there are things worth dying for. There are things worth dying for. The war protester, remember at the very beginning when he said, I'm against the war because nothing's worth dying for. He was wrong. Freedom is worth dying for. Our freedom. We have freedom today because people felt like it was worth dying for. And uh, we keep our freedom because we have people that are willing to die for our freedom. Uh, on November 19, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln was in Gettysburg. And um, he was going to participate in a dedication of the Soldier, uh, Soldiers National Cemetery there. And he got up and spoke for less than two minutes. And he said these words. He says, The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, while it, can never, while it can never forget what they did here. From these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we highly resolve these dead shall not have died in vain, uh, that this nation under God shall have uh, a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. And so that's what happened there. So freedom is worth dying for. A second thing worth dying for is your family and friends are worth dying for. John the Baptist was a friend of Jesus. He was his, also his cousin. But you know, Jesus was willing to die for his friends. So if we're going to emulate Jesus, it's, it's, he died for his friends. I guess we could say that we, uh, uh, f family and friends are worth dying for as well. And the Bible says in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And uh, there's a story of Chuck Colson during World War II. They were taken prisoners by the Japanese and they were in a prison camp. They had to go out every day and they had to do some kind of shoveling work. And at the end of the day, they were required to return all their shovels. And uh, the guard that was taking in all the shovels, he miscounted. And there was 20 men and he counted 19 shovels. And in a rage, he got up and he said, I demand the one that kept their shovel to step forth. And if they don't, five Americans will be shot. And after a few minutes, this one 19-year-old boy stepped forward 
And uh, then that uh, prison guard took out, his, took out his gun and shot him right in the head, and he died, a 19-year-old prisoner. And then later he recounted the, the shovels and all 20 were there. He just had miscounted. But that young boy died for his friends so that others would not die. So you're thinking, well, I wish I had a friend like that. You do. Jesus. He's the friend that laid down his life for us. So not only is freedom worth dying for, our, fa our family and friends are worth dying for, but our faith is worth dying for. Our faith. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But after he was arrested and put in prison, uh, he started having some doubts. You know the story where he sent his friends and said, Go to Jesus and ask him, Are, are you the one we're looking for? Or should we look for another? You know, I mean, he boldly says, Behold the Lamb of God. Which, but when you're in prison, and when you're having, I mean, we're having doubts. And that's the worst thing John the Baptist ever said about Jesus. Are you he should come, or do we look for another? And that doesn't sound really that bad, but he's just having some doubts here. That's the worst thing he ever said about Jesus. And Jesus said the best thing he ever said about him was that he was more than a prophet. There's not a greater, uh, uh, there's among men born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. I mean, have those words said about, from, uh, from Jesus about you? That means all the prophets of the Old Testament... There's none greater. Even all the people from the New Testament on, there's none greater. Jesus said of, of men born among women, there's not a greater than John the Baptist. So he was a great man. Luke 7, 28 is where that's at. And so John stood for the truth, he stood for the faith, and he ended up dying for the faith. Warren Wiersbe used to tell this story from China about a communist purge where they were trying to eliminate all the Christians in, in China and, and they wanted to go get, just get rid of them all and they wanted to arrest them and execute them. And one night there was a, 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 some soldiers came in and they had their weapons and they said, if you're, if, if you're a non-believer, get out of here. You can leave. And people got up and began leaving. And then after they were all gone, they locked the doors and they sat down and they said, now good, we just want to make sure there's all Christians here. I don't know if that story is true or not. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> Only thing we know is true is what's in the Bible or history records or whatnot. But Warren Wiersbe used to tell that story. And uh, they said, I want to join you. So our, our, our faith is worth dying for. Our freedom is worth dying for. And our family and friends are worth dying for. Hope we never have to do them. But there, those things are. When that, when that protester, protester said, nothing's worth dying for. He's wrong. Our faith, our family, and uh, our, 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 our freedom is worth dying for. And so those are the lessons we can learn from these people. But if you know, the one we identify most with, because we're guilty of it most, is, is the guilty conscience. Because you know, we all sin all the time. I mean, we're not going out doing the wicked stuff, of course, but we're, our human nature, we, we, we sin, we confess it, and we feel guilty. And, and, uh, but you don't have to have a guilty conscience. 1 John 1, 9 is there for us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we come, we ask your blessings on the invitation tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you'll do something in our hearts. And Lord, I know some people live with a guilty conscience, terrible, terribly guilty. And uh, they, it, it just bothers them so greatly. And uh, they just need to claim, claim 1 John 1, 9 and then uh, realize the word of God is true. But then, Lord, help us to listen to our conscience. Help us to listen to the Word of God, but listen to our conscience. It, it tells us right from wrong. And Lord, help us to, when we do do wrong, to run to you and confess it and make things right so that we can have our relationship where it ought to be. Lord, help us to learn the lessons from these, these four individuals in this story that we need to watch out about sin because it not only affects our own lives, but it affects those around us. Lord, help us to think about our children, our grandchildren, and, and our friends around us so that we don't uh, allow our, our sin to affect them. And so, Lord, would you bless in the invitation, please, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together as a piano plays. A couple of verses of invitation.
Don't forget, tomorrow night, if you can go over to Brother Randolph's meeting, please do that, and, and uh, that'll be a blessing to him. All right, let's bow our heads. Brother Goldchild, would you pray for us, please?